Hey guys, here we are again, lesson three. Are you enjoying this? You made a powerful statement to me in between these sessions. I want you to say it, Kenny. What, what did you say to me? Just with sin, if you wouldn't have been obedient to that pastor, what would, what would it have done to your family, to your boys, to your legacy, to your, your Addison's children, to his well, marriage? Would he just, be married to Julie? That just gripped me when you said it, and I realized that we not only affect ourselves, but we affect our legacy. So we have established how important it is to be submitted to God's direct authority. Now I want to, for the rest of these four lessons, talk about his delegated authority. So I'm going to read straight through on the scripture, and then we're going to go back and break it down. Ready? Okay. All right, Romans 13, 1 and 2. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist bring judgment on themselves. Now, Paul is specifically speaking about governmental leaders in this verse. There are four divisions of delegated authority in all of our lives. All right, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to name those. First of all, civil, and that's the one that Paul specifically speaks about that I just read about. That would be, you know, your president, vice president, et cetera, et cetera, right down to the policeman on the street. Next one's family. The next one's social. What do I mean by social authority? That would be your bosses, your teachers, your coaches, et cetera, right? Uh, your, your group leader, whatever. Fourth one is church authority, all right? So let's now, and, and let me say this. A lot of the scriptures that I'm going to show you might be about a specific one of these divisions. Generally, there are exceptions, but generally, the instruction for one overlaps on all of them. And I'm going to try to stay with the one that overlaps with all of them unless I specifically speak to one of these categories, these divisions. Got it? All right, so let's break it down. Verse by verse. You ready? Word by word, statement by statement. Let every soul, all right, so you can see every soul means me and you. Nobody is exempt. And can I make a statement here? This is not a suggestion. How, I, I mean, how many of you know that God doesn't give suggestions? Right. Right. His words are to be treated as commands, right? right? Love commands. Mm -hmm. Remember Paul says, I'm a love bond servant. Mm -hmm. They're love commands right. because we know ultimately he's doing it for our good, right? right? Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. Now that word subject is a very interesting word. It's the Greek word hupatasso, hupatasso, right? It's actually a Greek military term, and it means this, to arrange troop divisions under the command of a leader. In non-military usage, it was a voluntary attitude of giving in, cooperating, assuming responsibility, and carrying a burden. So you can see right here that this is speaking about we willingly put ourselves under that leader ready to obey mm -hmm. what they ask us to do, okay? And this is what God says. Let every, every soul be subject to the governing authorities. Now, let's keep reading. He said, for there is no authority mm -hmm. except from God. Mm -hmm. Now, remember in the first session, I said this. All authority is of God, right. but not all authority is godly. There right. are ungodly leaders, all right? right? For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Now, that word appointed is the Greek word tasso, which means to assign, ordain, or set. In no way does this word have a by chance implication. Yeah. Let me tell you when I first learned this. I'm going to kind of date myself here. I'm going to give you my age, all right? So I'm a young, young man, young, young man, and President Clinton was elected as the President of the United States. This was 1992, right? Yeah. I was depressed for three days. Okay, I mean literally depressed <laughs> mm -hmm. until the third day, God spoke to me so clearly. Mm -hmm. And he said, and, and it's almost like the Lord let me wa wallow in that depression yeah. for three days yeah. in my disobedience. Yeah. And he said this to me, son, nobody gets into office without me knowing about it. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So good. And all of a sudden I went, whoa. So my whole attitude changed and I started praying for President Clinton. I'll talk about that later, right? So this is, this is not a by chance thing, okay? Now, all authority is of God. I'm going to keep saying this, but not all authority is godly. Right. 
All right, let's, let's continue with Romans. Therefore, whoever resists the authority, resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist bring judgment on themselves. So when you resist a delegated authority, you're resisting the one that God has instituted. Yeah. He's delegated his authority to. Yeah. In essence, you're resisting God himself. Okay, now, I know all kinds of questions are going on with everybody. Wait a minute, my leader, what if he tells me to sin, do this, do that, do this? We'll get to that. Just stay with me, please. I am going to cover all of this, all right? But I want to I just keep rolling this out as we need to. But notice you bring judgment on themselves. Remember, I am not teaching this as a person who's trying to beat his team members into submission. I am a person that had made so many mistakes when I was under authority, working for those two very large ministries, I brought some forms of judgment on myself, and I really don't want that for any single person. So please understand, that is my heart, okay? I am for you. God is for you, okay? This is what he is telling us is for you, all right? For your good. So the common rebuttal that we all hear, but wait a minute, there's evil, cruel, dishonest leaders, okay? How do we, how do we address this? Yeah. Now remember, the authorities of God, the behavior's not, mm -hmm. right. okay? Right. But the authorities of God. Mm -hmm. Well, then why would God give somebody that's cruel and dishonest that kind of authority? Well, let me give a biblical example. Let's go to somebody to the, to the category of Hitler or Stalin. I mean, I can't think of two more cruel leaders in the last hundred years than Hitler and Stalin, okay? I want to talk about somebody in that category, yeah. Pharaoh, okay? Let's think about Pharaoh. Pharaoh is enslaving an entire nation, right. giving them the scraps, putting them in slums. He's putting stripes on the backs of innocent people, yeah. making them work to build his inheritance and his people's inheritance and they get nothing, mm. right? He's killing their children in cold blood. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a wicked, wicked leader, right? Yeah. So did God put Pharaoh into office? Well, let's talk about it. Mm. If we look at Exodus 19.6 and Romans 9.17, two places in the Bible, this is God's direct word to Pharaoh. I have raised you up. Mm. God said to Pharaoh, I gave you the authority. Are you seeing this? Yeah. Now, how did God raise him up? In order to understand how God raises up Pharaoh, you got to go way back to Abraham. And God speaks to Abraham one day, and look what Abraham, God says to Abraham. He says, know for certain that for 400 years, your descendants <laughs> will be strangers in a country not their own and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. Mm -hmm. The New King James says afflicted. So they're going to be enslaved. And so God tells this to Abraham, right? Mm -hmm. How would I like it if God says to me, yeah. your children and children, children and children are going to be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. Do you understand that would bring us to 2400 AD. Wow. Okay, that's not something you're dancing about, right? right. Uh -huh. But yet God tells Abraham, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, how did Abraham's children get under Pharaoh? Were they disobedient? Were they wicked? Well, you got to look at Abraham's son was Isaac. He was godly. Jacob started out a little shaky, but he got very godly, right? Yeah. Then he has these 12 sons. And the most godly of all the 12 sons is Joseph. Oh. Joseph's brothers envy him. God gives him a dream of leadership. They sell him to slavery to Egypt, right? Yeah. He goes to Egypt. He's a slave for 10 years. He gets accused of doing something he didn't do. He's right. thrown into the dungeon. He's in the dungeon. He interprets these two guys' dreams, right? We remember this whole story, right? Yeah. And God gives Pharaoh a dream about what's about to come on the earth. God gives Pharaoh a dream that there's a seven years of abundance and seven years of famine. But Pharaoh can't interpret this dream that God gave to him. Right. Somebody says, hey, there's a guy in the dungeon. He interpreted my dream that came to true. Yeah. Joseph comes up, interprets the dream. Pharaoh makes him number two over all of Egypt, mm. right? So famine comes not only on Egypt, but the whole world. Right. So guess who now has no food? Jacob. We're talking Abraham's grandson, right. uh, Israel, right? He and his sons, they're starving. Yeah. And he hears the only place that has food because of the wisdom that Joseph right. gave Pharaoh, because of the dream that God gave Pharaoh, yeah. the only people that have got food is Egypt. Mm -hmm. So they all come and buy. Joseph reveals himself. Mm -hmm. And all of Abraham's descendants, all 70-some of them, mm -hmm. end up in Egypt under Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. yes. Why didn't God give the dream to Jacob? Why didn't God give the dream 
to Israel and let all the people come. Because you want to know why? Because God wanted Pharaoh to become the most powerful man in the whole world. He wanted him to be the richest, most powerful leader in the world. He raised him up. Wow. Now, why? And, and, and let me, I, I want to confirm that I'm not teaching heresy here, okay? I want, I, I, want you to sh- I want you to see what Joseph says to his brothers when he reveals himself. Look what he says. But now do not therefore be grieved and angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me here. Before you to preserve life, and God sent me here two times, before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. Three times. Now maybe Joseph's a little off kilt, right? But you know what the psalmist says? Look what the psalmist says. God sent a man. His name was Joseph. Before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They hurt his feet with fetters. So it was God who sent Joseph there, and it was God who gave Pharaoh the dream. Didn't give Israel, Abraham's grandson, the dream. Why? Why would God do this? In this incident, we get the wisdom on it. Why? For the sake of redemption. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The sake of redemption, what does is, what is, what is all these guys being brutally enslaved for 400 years have to do with redemption? Yeah. Okay? You have to remember, up to that point, nobody on earth knew who God was. Mm-hmm. Only Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their descendants. And even some of the descendants didn't know after 400 years because they said to Moses, who sent you? Right. What was Pharaoh's first words to Moses? Who is this Lord that says I'm supposed to let my slaves go? that I should obey him, right? right? Mm -hmm. 40 years after God delivers them out of Egypt, right? Mm -hmm. Well, let's first of all deal 40 years earlier. After God got through with Egypt, everybody in Egypt knew who the Lord was. Everybody. And even some of the Egyptians respected Moses because they said, his God's the real God. His God's the God of heaven and earth. 40 years later, the spies go into uh, Jericho. And Rahab says, the men of our city's hearts are fainting with fear because we know the God who destroyed Egypt, the real God, is among you. Wow. Right? Yeah. And then you go hundreds of years later, right. and when they, under Eli, brought the ark, when Hophni and Phinehas brought the ark, Israel all went crazy, and the Philistine says, this is Elohim, this is God yeah. who destroyed the Egyptians. Mm-hmm. So what happened was now God's name was known throughout the earth and it was the beginning of that prophecy to Abraham in you, all the families are going to be blessed. There's something we've got to understand. There is something more important to God than our personal comfort Mm. and that is the redemption of souls. Think about it. If Jesus would have put his personal comfort above us, he never would have died on the cross. And that's why the Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. There are times, many times, God will put people under these type of leaders. Their behavior is definitely not of God. Don't even associate with the behavior with God. It's not. And one day that leader will be judged because the Bible says a leader is going to be judged with a more stricter judgment, right? Because they've been entrusted with souls. But God is not ignorant of who your leader is, whether it's in the civil realm, the social realm, it's in the family realm, it's in the church realm. He knows. Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't it God that put David under Saul? Isn't it God who put Samuel under Eli? Now there's two very godly men, two of the greatest men in the Bible, Samuel and David. Both of them God put under Mm -hmm. very corrupt leaders. Are you seeing this? But they ended up becoming some great leaders themselves. All right, and none of that was accidental, and we will talk about that, all right? So let's restate the four divisions of authority, civil, family, social, and church. Now, I'm going to go over each of these in the next two sessions, all right? But over the many, many years, I've heard repetitively, and this is a common thing. Anytime I teach on this or people have heard me mention it, their first question is this. Is, un, is obedience unconditional? Do I have to obey no matter what my leader says? And that is such a good question. And I want to clear that one up because I'm almost concerned we're going to lose some people on our lessons if they don't hear what I have to say about yeah. this, okay? Or what yeah. the Bible has to say about this. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to address this now. I want to, in order to do so, I want to go to Hebrews 13, 17. 
Now, in Hebrews 13, 17, we see the Paul specifically here speaking about church leadership, right? Because watch, they watch out for your souls. So we're really specifically talking about church leadership here, right? But it, this spans out. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive. For they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Remember, I'm not speaking for the leader's sake. I'm speaking for your sake, who is under leadership, which is all of us. Notice he says, obey those who rule over you and be submissive. Now, how many of you know here that we can obey but not necessarily be submitted? Okay, I remember when I really first learned this, you know, I was working for this big, massive church, right? One of the best known churches in the country. I was the pastor's executive assistant. That was a glorified title for gopher. <laughs> go for this, go for that, right? So I took care of their personal needs, their family needs. I remember one time I'm in the parking lot of a grocery store. I had just bought their groceries for their family and I'm weeping. I'm like 8,000 people in this church. Why do I get to be the guy wow. who gets to take care of this great man and woman of God and their family, right? Yeah. Well, that honeymoon lasted for about a year and a half, and then it wore off, right? And now I became critical of my pastor because I was oh, so wow. close to him, right? right? I thought I was being discerning, oh, wow. but I was actually being critical. See, yeah. anybody can be critical. All you need is two eyes and a carnal brain, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But to be discerning, Philippians chapter 1 says, all discernment is rooted in the love of God. Mm -hmm. So now... I'm not being critical. I, I mean, I'm not being discerning. I'm being critical. Yeah. I, don't, I think I'm being discerning, though, yeah. with all my heart. Mm -hmm. And I start talking about the things I'm seeing with my pastor. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about my wife. She's not saying a whole lot. I'm talking with for close friends. And one night, after about six months of this, I go, I go to this, 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 family's, um, this, fa uh, this family who they also were in the executive team. Now, for six months, now, I want you to hear me. My pastor was probably one of the greatest preachers in America. For six solid months, I wasn't getting a thing out of what he preached. Wow. And you know what the big buzzword was in my family? I kept saying this to Lisa. I said, I'm not being fed. I'm just not being fed at church. I'm not being fed. So we go to dinner with this couple who's also in the executive team six months later. And I bring it up at dinner. And I said, guys, I'm just not getting fed at church. They go, we're not getting fed either. Oh, did we have a spiritual conversation? I don't know what spirit it was of, but it was a spiritual <laughs> conversation. And they were like, oh my gosh, we, we, we're getting nothing from the messages. So we all determined around the table, and Lisa was quiet the whole time. We all determined around the table, the three of us, the husband, the wife, and me, that our time at this church had come to a close and God was allowing us to dry up on the vine so that when we leave this oasis, we wouldn't miss it and come back when we hit hard times. We, we had it, man. We nailed it, right? Wow. So two days later, I'm praying. I can close my eyes and remember where I was when I was praying because I will never forget what God said to me. I'm praying, and the Holy Spirit says this to me. He said, the problem's not with your pastor. The problem is with you. Yeah. And I went, What? He said, son, you keep saying you're not being fed. What does Isaiah 119 say? And I quoted it because I knew it from memory. If you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land, right? And the Lord said, there's your problem right there. I said, God, I'm obedient. I do everything my pastor tells me to do. Yeah. And he said, son, I didn't say if you're obedient, you'd eat the good of the land. If you're willing. He said, willing deals with attitude. Mm -hmm. Obedience deals with actions. And he said, your attitude stinks. And he reminded me of when I was a kid, when I was a teenager. My favorite program, now I'm really going to date myself, was a program <laughs> called Beretta. It was about this New Jersey, Newark detective and a bird named Fred. And it was, it was, it was, it was hilarious. It was, it was, his name was Robert Blake. He was the actor, right? And I watched it every Wednesday night. It came on at 9 o'clock and finished at 10. Well, 10 o'clock was bedtime in the Bevere household. And being the only boy of six children, who is the garbage man? Me. So... <laughs> Thursday morning, the garbage men would come always before we woke up. They came that early, right? So my job was to make sure the garbage can was at the end of the driveway. Well, it was almost supernatural how this happened, right? My mom would walk in to that program, the climax. I mean, right when Rooster gave Beretta the information he needed to catch the criminal, right? And my, 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 my mom would look at me and go, son, did you take the garbage to, out, out to the end of the driveway yet? And I go, no, ma'am. She goes, I want you to do it right now. And I said, yes, ma'am. And I grabbed the garbage, took the pails down. I, I was obedient. I looked like I was submitted. I had a good attitude. But inside, I'm going, I can't believe she can't wait until the end of this program, right? right, right. And I'd miss the climax scene, right? Oh, no. So the Lord said, that's exactly the way you're doing it at this church right now. Wow. 
So Yikes. I repented right on that spot, okay? The next Sunday morning, same pastor, same series of messages. I'm in the same seat. Mm. All of heaven opened up. Man. And you know what I did? I cried for 40 minutes while my pastor preached. And I thought, what have I missed these last six months because of my attitude? We have a video that our team put together that's absolutely amazing. It's called Frankly Speaking. I think that will illustrate this point really well. Watch it. Okay, so what this device is doing is capturing my thoughts and transmitting it to your earpieces. Yeah, all right, everybody put your earpieces in. All right, now, watch this. Can you guys hear me? You're now hearing my thoughts in real time. Oh, oh wow. God. That is so cool. Is that, is that cool? Yes. I know, I know. Mr. Anthony, you try it. Oh, okay, sure. Uh, if you don't meet your quarterly numbers, you're all fired. <laughs> so, so what the power in this is, is you can send an email with your thoughts, okay? Like, like imagine you're buried in a project, you think it, it automatically Perfect. sends. Perfect. Yeah. Hey guys. Oh, welcome. Hey, hey. Frank. I'm so sorry I'm late, so no, sorry I'm late. Could. Hope I didn't miss too much of the big oh, presentation. Oh, yeah. Oh, Chels, digging that hair. You guys, hang on just a second. I have to take a moment to brag on this guy. Frank, as you all know, has been crushing his quarterly yes. sales numbers. Yes. Yes. Seriously. I would trust this guy with my kids. Oh, well, well, sir, we all know that that's just because of your great leadership. And of course, anytime, I love those kids. Those kids are such brats. Um, Frank, uh, you are, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, actually, let's just wait a second. Uh, Frank, about that quarterly project I gave you, you're like, so how's that coming? Oh, it's, it's going great. Actually, you know, let me just take this opportunity to say what an honor it is, sir, that you actually trust me with it. Yep. Just another waste of time, like all those other projects you assigned me. Really? Yeah. Best meeting of the day. Uh, um, Frank. We can all hear you. Well, yeah, of course. I mean, can't you see him talking to Mr. Anthony? And can't you see you should try something maybe new with your hair every now and then? Do you think she realizes how horrible her hair is? I mean, it's like a bird's nest. That is so true. Wait, no. Chelsea? Chelsea, I'm so sorry. Chelsea, Chelsea, Chelsea! What's her problem? Uh, um. So what I was saying is that this device is your big presentation that you've been working on all week. Bro, I am so excited to hear about this. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, psh, why do you always make these stupid inventions? You really think you're gonna get a promotion for this piece of junk? Yeah, I'm gonna punch you right in the face. Okay, guys, I think that's about enough for today. Uh, Frank, can you just be sure you have that project to me by the end of next week? Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm just excited about getting it all done, sir. I'm about as excited as I am to see a retired old man. We all know I can run this company way better than you could. <laughs> he has done it now. Uh-huh. Um, so, so, so Tom, what is this thing, man? Oh, this is a device that captures your thoughts and transmits it to everyone around you. Everyone. <laughs> wait, 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 so, so this is a, this is a device that mm -hmm. trans, my, my, my thought. <laughs> okay, um, is it, <laughs> uh, is it on right now? Is it? It's been on the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you know, guys, I'm not sure what you've Frank. heard over the past few, yeah? You're fired. Yep, okay. No, no, no. I'll see you later, Tom, or? No. no. Bye, Frank. Yep, yeah. <laughs> all right, all right, guys, that was pretty good, right? That illustrates the point right there, right? Okay, so you can be obedient, but not submissive or willing, right? Mm -hmm. Do you know that you can be submissive and not obedient? Now, obey those who rule over you and be submissive. You can be submitted, 
Because remember, submission deals with your attitude. Yeah. Obedience deals with your actions. Remember the parable Jesus tells about the two sons, right. right? What does the first son say? Sure, dad, I'll do it. I'll go work in your field. And he doesn't do it. The other kid goes, no. And he later does it. Jesus said, which one did the will of his father? It wasn't the first one. It was the second one. Right. So here's the deal. We want to be willing and obedient, right? Right. right. So here's the situation I want you to understand. Submission, when the Bible speaks of submission, deals with our heart attitude. Mm -hmm. Obedient, the Bible speaks of our actions. Yeah. Are we, all right? So now where do we draw the line? Here's where it gets really important, all right? Is obedience unconditional? I want to ask that question again. Is obedience unconditional? The answer is no. There is one time, and I emphasize only one time, that the Bible tells us not to obey an authority. And that is when authority tells us to do something that's contrary to what's written in this book, when he tells us to sin, or she tells us to sin, all right? If you look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? They come into Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar is king, who God called my servant, in Jeremiah 25, 9 and 27, 5 through 7. Yet this guy is so disobedient to God, he becomes like a wild ox for a year. But God called him my servant because he gave his authority to Nebuchadnezzar, right? So Nebuchadnezzar builds this 90-foot statue and says, every time you hear the music play, you need to bow down and worship it, right? Well, that violates the second commandment. So the music plays, everybody bows except Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're standing and they're not bowing, Right? Well, the king hears about it. He's furious. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are brought before the king, I want you to notice what they say. I want you to notice this. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, because that's what the penalty was for not worshiping the statue, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you've set up. So they do not obey the king's command to sin. Right. But do you notice they don't look at him and say, you jerk of a dog. <laughs> yeah. what, do you, what, do you, what do you think you are wearing that crown? You're, right. you're, you're a jerk. Right. We're not obeying you. Yeah. No way. Right. They don't obey his command to sin, mm. but they keep a submitted attitude. So yeah. the Bible teaches unconditional submission to authority. Mm. Unconditional. But not unconditional obedience. In fact, let me tell you this. Uh, let's let's look at this from a family perspective. Can we do that mm -hmm. really yeah. quick? And, and and we'll talk about family in, 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 in upcoming lessons. But in the same way, you wives must accept the authority of your husbands. Are you seeing this? Then even if some refuse, some husbands refuse to obey the good news, your godly lives will speak to them without any words. So if a husband's not obeying the word of God, guess who's getting mistreated? It's the wife, yeah. right? They will be, but, but look what Peter says, they will be won over by observing your pure and your reverent lives. In other words, your submitted heart. But is a wife supposed to obey her husband if he tells her to sin? No. If the phone, let's say the cell phone rings and she grabs the cell phone, picks it up, and she says, honey, you know, um, your boss is on the phone. And the husband says, tell him I'm not home. She goes, sweetheart, I love you. I can tell your boss you don't want to talk to him right now or you can take it, but I'm not going to lie to him. Yeah. She's keeping a submitted heart. She's like, you jerk! <laughs> Why did I ever marry you? She goes, honey, I'm not going to obey your command for me to sin. Right. Yeah. So she keeps a submitted attitude, yeah. but she doesn't obey, right? Mm. Husband says to the wife, you can never go to church. She goes, honey, your meal's in the oven. I love you so very much. But God said, don't yeah. forsake yeah. the assembling of yourselves yeah. together. I, me and the kids are going to church. Yeah. She does it with a submitted attitude because yeah. the Bible teaches unconditional submission. That that's our attitude, right. but she doesn't obey his command. In fact, let me tell you something. Scripture shows that God will bless people, bless people yeah. for not obeying the command of sin, right? Yeah. If you look at the midwives, Pharaoh said, kill the baby boys, right? Well, they didn't do it. And watch this. But because the midwives feared God, they refused to obey the king's orders. Why? Because the king's telling them to murder kids, right? right? Yeah. They allowed the boys to live too. And because the midwives feared God, because he, they obeyed God and not that king, yeah. he gave them families of their own. Uh -huh. See, they got blessed. If you look at Paul, Paul, right, calls the high priest a white wash sepulcher, right? Remember that? But before I do that, let's go back to earlier to Peter and John. The same group of men tell Peter and John, you can never preach the name of Jesus or teach the name of Jesus. 
Well, that violates the word of God. Jesus said, go into all the world and, and, and right? Mm -hmm. Preach the gospel. Yeah. So look what the guys, look, look what Peter and John says. But Peter and John replied, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? Mm -hmm. Right? right. Mm -hmm. And do you know what God, the Bible says as a result? With great power. This is right after they refused to obey. Wow. With great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection. God blessed. Mm -hmm. They're not obeying the order to sin. And if you look at the submitted attitude, look at Paul. He calls the high priest a whitewashed sepulcher, right? Mm -hmm. He gets slapped across the face, right? Mm -hmm. And calls the, the, the high priest that? Yeah. Look what Paul says. I'm sorry, brothers. I didn't realize he was the high priest. Paul replied, for scripture says you must not speak evil against any of your rulers. Mm -hmm. So you see, the disciples had the posture of we're not going to obey their commands. The Because you've got to remember the Pharisees, they were not only the, uh, the spiritual leaders, they were the political leaders of Israel because Rome let those nations govern themselves. Paul, Paul and these apostles had the attitude, if they tell us to sin, they tell us to disobey the word of Jesus, we're not going to do it, but we're going to keep a submitted attitude. Yeah. Paul apologized and said, I'm so sorry for saying that to you. Wow. So he kept a submitted attitude of respect towards that, towards Annas, the high priest, who had him slapped, all right? Are you seeing this? Yeah. So... Um, there's a lot more to, to address. I hope that I've calmed fears. You know, I'm sure that there's a few fears there uh, at the beginning when we were talking about let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. Yeah. We can understand now yeah. that God never intends us to obey an authority telling us to do sin, yeah. to, to disobey his word. There yeah. is a higher authority. Yeah. So that is emphasized. I want that emphasized all the time in the, during this lesson, in this course, I'll emphasize it in every uh, lesson coming up, but we're, we're beginning to understand the blessing, the provision, the peace that comes from submitting to God's authority, whether it's direct or delegated. We'll go into more into the other, in other three in the next couple lessons.